All right, we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, as people file in, we'll just see as they come in. Um, so yeah, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Chelsea Goulding, and I am the Agriculture Education Program Manager at ASD, or Appalachian Sustainable Development. ASD is a nonprofit established in 1995, and our mission is to build a thriving regional food and agriculture system that creates healthy communities, respects the planet, and cultivates profitable opportunities for Appalachians. You are joining us tonight for the next installment of our 2021 Grow Your Own webinar series. For some background, the Grow Your Own program was established in 2012 to empower beginning home community and market gardeners. The program provides foundational agriculture education through webinars on small scale intensive diversified production. To dive into a bit of housekeeping before we get started, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question and answer or the chat feature. I'll keep an eye on those and answer what I can, interject as appropriate, or note them to bring up later. Even if you don't have any questions, the chat feature is a great place to show your enthusiasm during the lecture or share any personal stories you may have from your agricultural es escapades. As you're sending messages, please be aware of whether or not you're sending to all panelists or panelists and attendees, or I guess hosts and panelists, or everyone. Um, the last 15 minutes of our time is reserved for a question and answer session. And our presenter tonight is a longtime Grow Your Own favorite lecturer. Ben Castile is the horticulture instructor at Virginia Highlands Community College, as well as a longtime home and market farmer, an ASD board member, and a consultant for Dharma Pharmaceuticals in Abingdon. So I will hand over the reins to you, Ben, and I will let you share your screen. All righty, let me get it up here. Just one second, bear with me. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, as Chelsea mentioned, I, I am Horticulture Instructor and Program Coordinator at Virginia Highlands Community College and uh, getting excited about our upcoming semester being back in person. And I'm um, also excited about extending the season for um, my garden um, as we work into, uh, let's see, can you guys see that? All right, I'm not sure which screen it's showing right now. <laughs> you can see the presentation notes, so no notes. Okay. <laughs> if you, okay. It works. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, so uh, we've got, I guess, all together about, um, gosh, a little over 2,000 square feet of uh, garden space right now. Um, so not a not huge gardens, but enough to uh, keep us busy. And so I'm always thinking about um, what can we plant next, and how do we do it. So, um, and the images here on our uh, slide show beginning, um, you can see that season extension has been practiced for a long time. Um, on the left there is an image of some glass cloches, oh, sorry, um, which are basically just a bell-shaped glass feature used to cover individual plants. So that was a long season extension method before the advent of plastic, which we now use readily and uh, make good use of here um, and kind of a little low tunnel kind of cold frame kind of deal. All right, so I think the most important thing when we talk about season extension is uh, just what are your objectives? You need to establish some objectives and try to figure out what you're trying to do. And well, obviously we're all trying to extend our growing season so we get more of our wonderful garden produce longer. Um, but what exactly are you trying to do beyond extending the season? What are you trying to grow? Are you trying to just extend the season or maybe are you trying to grow some crops out of what you would think the regular season is? And think of gardening as um, a lot of windows in a way. 
And instead of that window being open or shut, there are intervals which they are open. Um, and it, you don't have to really, you know, close yourself inside of a box. Um, we like to think outside the box and experiment, but don't get too far outside of the box. There are some things that are just either too difficult or just doesn't make sense to try to grow out of season. Maybe you want to overwinter some crops, which um, there are some crops that only really produce well if they are overwintered. Um, immediately, the thing that comes to mind is garlic. Um, you have to have a, a certain period of time of cold weather for garlic to produce bulbs. Um, overwintering other crops, um, like sprouting broccoli, for instance, um, can be lucrative and uh, high yielding. If you take a look at that, you can overwinter leeks. There are many things that we can try to continue to grow over the winter, even though that during the winter months, they don't grow very much. Also, what is it that you want to grow? So whenever we talk about what you want to grow, you need to know what the kind of parameters are for the crops. And so I'll try to put crops in a box in a way um, based first on their seasonality. And there's a few different ways to look at that. Um, first, the time that it takes for the crop to get to maturity. So we have three categories here are quick crops, which are things that can produce in as little as 30 days. Um, things like uh, baby greens, like lettuce or spinach. We have our short season crops, take a little bit more time. Things like radishes, for instance, some um, warm season sh um, short crops like a hybrid squash, for instance, summer squash can be pretty short season. Um, things that usually take um, 60 days or less. And then long season crops, those that take longer than 60 days. Um, most of the warm season crops that we like. So that's uh, one way to look at the seasonality. We also think of seasonality in terms of what are warm season crops, those crops, of course, that can um, withstand, um, or sorry, that do not withstand frost. So it can really only be grown above 40 degrees and those cool season crops, which can handle some frost and can be grown below 40 degrees. So we kind of think of that sort of 40 to 50 degree mark as being our um, barrier between warm season and cool season crops. Um, and know that seasonality for those crops, but also know it for your particular site. So um, I'm thinking of Abingdon or Damascus area but um, maybe some of you live in, say, White Top. You know, it's a totally different uh, period of time that you can grow and in which you might apply these different parameters. We kind of base that on temperature, of course. So we look at the minimum temperature that a crop must have for seed to be able to germinate and for the crop to be able to grow. The maximum temperature, of course, above which the crop declines and the optimum level. So of course, if we're growing outdoors, we can't control the temperature. Um, we can influence it to a certain degree. Um, so we, we don't really get to enjoy this optimum level like we do um, in controlled climate production, like in a indoor setting or in a greenhouse. So we have to kind of operate within these parameters and we have to know which crops will produce in those areas. So know what you want to grow if you want to extend the season hey ben this, can i interject real quick yes please all right we so we can see the the section that shows that you have or the frame that shows that you have no notes which is fine but okay i just wanted you to i was confusing sorry <laughs> no worries let me i guess i could see if i can switch here can you see my little laser pointer too all right, I'll just continue on this so we don't switch around. I don't think it hopefully doesn't. It should all be good. No worry. How's that? Okay. Uh, let's talk about some just some methods of season extension in general before we get into more detail. And we'll kind of go from the lowest tech to the higher tech and the lowest cost to the highest cost. 
there's a great range when we talk about extending the season. Um, so first, the simplest and most uh, least costly is just picking the right plant and the right site for that plant. More about that in just a second. Um, raised beds cost more money, um, can pay off. And it doesn't necessarily mean a raised bed like we build something. It could just be raising up the soil, like a mounding it for your beds. Um, just a few inches can make a difference. Transplanting is another low cost, low tech method of extending the season and can pay off, but um, take, requires some space, some knowledge, and somewhat controlled climate. Mulches are another way of extending the season that can be fairly uh, cheap, but they can also be expensive. Um, and I think overall, they can be very cost effective if used properly. And then we talk about structures. So using things like cold frames or high tunnels, or if you got the big bucks, greenhouses. Um, this is obviously more money, but um, when used at the right time for the right crop can definitely pay off. So uh, let's just think about where we are right now and um, what kind of season we're working with and how we might extend the current season. You know, so we're in the, what you might consider the dog days of summer, hot and dry, it's August 10th. If we count backwards for like the Abingdon area, then we have around 60 days until frost. And that's if we say that our first frost date is October 10th. Um, the past few years, the first killing frost that we've had on the campus of the community college has actually been in November. So that 60 days could be longer. Um, it, again, it just depends on where you are, what your site is, what the topography is like. So anyway, let's just say that we do have about that 60 days. What can we grow in that period? If we're gonna think about the warm season crops, we can only do the quick or short season crops. Um, I like to call them the 60 day sensations. So uh, most of these are kind of hybrid varieties or um, just very short season, short window crops. Um, radishes, for instance, there are a few um, squash varieties that can grow in 60 days or less. Um, very few out there that will be productive for much longer than that because of where we are. So if we're thinking about extending our warm season, what we have left, um, there's not much we can do without some degree of protection. But we can really be thinking about our long, um, cool season crops, which are most of our brassicas, things like broccoli, cabbage, um, Brussels sprouts, which I think grow best in fall, um, et cetera. And the root crops are um, beets, carrots, um, turnips. Some of those really do best in the fall as well. I think most of them actually. And also we can be preparing for our overwintering crops. So I mentioned garlic earlier. And for garlic, you have to have 40 days under 40 degrees for it to bulb. So we think of garlic as being planted kind of late in the season. Um, we're usually trying to plant it before we start to get much winter moisture coming in. So usually before November, um, but as long as it gets that 40 days under 40 degrees, it will start to bulb up. Um, the more days, the better. So that's kind of just a brief overview of what we could do and how we could extend the season based on our current date. Um, again, you know, for if we're thinking of trying to get some more warm season crops, we can do some successional sowing, you know, plant another round of something. Um, some beans might be good. Um, there are a few squash varieties, things like that. I'm still going to try to get another round of cucumbers in myself. Of course, um, when we're thinking about where we are now, the dog days of summer, we want to think about doing that summer sowing. So 
Sowing in the summer, we have some barriers. First of which, of course, is that oppressive heat and sun. So if we're thinking about growing fall crops, cool season crops, then um, you have to protect them from that heat and sun. Um, the other big issue that we have is that we have a lot of pests around. Um, and those pests can destroy any crop that you might start, especially when we think of brassicas. We got the harlequin bugs are in full fury right now. We have the, the cabbage moths um, out there basically laying their eggs on our brassicas. So good barrier. Uh, it's a big barrier there and there are some ways to overcome that as well. Um, another barrier that we might not be thinking of since it is hot and sunny are that the days are getting shorter and we'll run into this kind of short day factor. Um, it's a ways away before we really have to worry about it, but we just need to be aware that the days are getting shorter. So how do you overcome those barriers? Um, so we can get around the heat and sun by planting early in the morning or later in the evening, um, especially if we're transplanting. That can, um, even though it's just a few hours, it will help to kind of acclimate the plants somewhat. Um, speaking of which, you always want to acclimate any transplants. Um, so planting in the evening is going to be better for you and better for your plants or early in the morning. You can also use what you already have in your garden to your benefit or the plants benefit by using some of the shade from your tall summer crops. Um, so maybe think about planting, say, cabbage underneath your tomatoes. Um, maybe as you get into the next um, planning session for your next garden, think about leaving some extra space so that you could do something like that. Um, if you don't have that space right now, then it's not a big deal. Just think of a way how you might be able to use that in the future. Tall summer crops cast some shade if they're planted in a particular manner. So use that shade to your advantage. Hydro cool is just a fancy term for using water. Um, we could use, uh, um, be careful with this because if you put water in you know, the heat of the day, sometimes that can cause some sun scald, um, but if you add water to plants, um, misting them early in the morning or uh, later in the day as it's starting to cool off, then that can cool the temperature around the plants. We also just wanna keep soil moist for anything that could be germinating. I like to use drip irrigation for that, for things like carrots, for instance, or you could uh, even completely cover your crop um, the seeds that you have just sowed so that that moisture is held in the soil instead of evaporating. Um, for all of these barriers, I highly recommend the use of row cover, which we'll talk about in more detail here in a bit. So the most simple form of season extension is just coming up with the right site, knowing when and where to plant. Um, based on what your planting area, where it is, and what those factors are like. So usually in the spring, we're thinking about planting um, or growing a garden somewhere where we have southern exposure, because that's best for sun. Um, but if we're thinking about growing cooler weather crops, then we might do the opposite and plant it maybe in a more eastern or northern exposure so that you get some of that protection um, from the sun. We also wanna think about wind exposure. Generally, we think of wind as kind of being a bad thing. Um, in some ways, it could be a good thing for um, growing cool season crops and getting them started in the summer heat. It's always important to know what your soil type is, and that can correspond to differences in the temperature in your site as well. So. If you have a, a soil that is rich in organic matter and is darker, then it's going to absorb heat a little bit better. If you have um, a heavier clay soil, then it's going to hold more moisture 
which the specific heat of water is much higher than air. So it's going to stay warmer longer than if you had, uh, say, a sandier soil. So knowing your soil type and how that kind of corresponds can be good for planning and planting um, your crops in the proper time frame, um, depending on whether it's cool season or warm season. Um, raised beds are, are great. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to build um, a raised bed out of wood or whatever material you want to use. Um, but even just mounding soil up in your bed can basically means that it's going to drain quicker and that will allow it to warm up quicker, but also cool off quicker as well. So that can, raised beds can be very useful for both um, kind of warm season extension as well as cool season starting. All of this is really about our microclimates. So we think of what are the subtle nuances of the temperature and moisture in a particular area of your site? Um, I like to really go out and kind of later in the summer and, and into the fall, you can really start to feel those differences in the microclimate. So you can feel where cool air sinks, for instance, and use that as a way to plan to um, plant your cool season crops um, maybe in the summer going into the fall, but when you're in the spring, you want to avoid that area because that's probably subject to later frosts. So um, microclimates could be a whole nother class, so we'll, we'll save that for later, but just be really thinking and taking notes about what your area is like throughout the seasons. Know your plants and know the right place for that plant. So what is the microclimate in that area and what plant best suits it? Here's just an example of microclimate and how shade can, or creating shade can work to your advantage in the summer. So we've got um, raised beds. One has some sort of uh, shade covering and one is just completely out in the open. As you can see, the lettuce is doing much better where it's shaded. Speaking of shade, here's just a, a look at some of the crops that we can grow um, without that ideal amount of light, which means that we could be starting these under our taller summer crops, um, in this kind of in these dog days of summer. So um, lots of different crops that we can be starting that don't necessarily need eight hours of direct sun a day. Um, the more sun you have, the better, but these plants can be um, usually sowed in the right area at the right time. All right, um, let's talk about when just for a second because we generally think of, of wind as a bad thing because it does increase transpiration for our uh, taller crops like corn. If we have a really severe wind, it can cause lodging um, crops to fall over. Um, it can cause summer squash to wilt, even though it has plenty of moisture. Um, so we think of wind as um, a bad thing, right? It increases stress in general for our crops, but we can also use that to our advantage because wind is also going to you know, move um, heat away. It's gonna be drying, but um, if you use it properly, then and plan on planting cooler season crops in areas where you have wind exposure, um, that can be just a way of using, making the most of your microclimate. Um, generally in the spring, we're thinking about using some sort of wind break, um, a way to use maybe shrubbery, maybe a building to block the, the effects of wind. But now in the summer, we might be thinking of a way to uh, use that wind for our benefit. Um, the downside, of course, is that it does cause drying of crops. So we need to be sure that we're adding the moisture that our plants need. Also want to make a brief mention here, just your soil type and 
getting the proper nutrition. Now, you can't extend the season of a crop if all the nutrients have already been used up for your main season crops. And uh, this is just looking at um, corn using different fertilizers. Um, this control group over here, the A is using no fertilizer. Uh, your corn doesn't grow very well, right? So um, anyway, all I, all I wanna mention here is just that think about fertilizing, think about adding those nutrients that your crop has removed if you want to extend the season. And also, um, I know some of you might be commercial growers. Um, most of you probably are not um, solely commercial growers, but let's think and pretend that maybe we are for a moment. Consider the commercial practices. Um, so in the United States, um, we're basically growing our produce in the places where we have the best possible climate for those crops. Um, so, you know, 90% of our produce in the US comes from just a handful of states. And uh, the highest proportion of that is coming from California. California is a great um, example because we have um, high elevation valleys that have cooler microclimates where they grow greens almost year round. And then we have the Central Valley, where it's very warm, where they're growing um, warm season crops almost year round. So that's why there's so much stuff coming from California. Um, we find the best climate to grow the, the correct crop and we ship it around the country, around the world. It's not always where the best resources are. Of course, California, we know, is in a long standing drought. Um, we cannot control the climate, but we can influence the microclimate. So I think even though we're here in a white state where we're producing less than 1% of the country's produce, we are in an area where we could be producing much more. So all I'm saying here is that season extension starts with identifying those proper climate variables for the correct crop. So um, maybe think about using this kind of commercial practice ideology to your advantage. All right, so let's get in, into actually extending the season and starting off with just selecting different varieties using the proper genetics of the plants. And one of the figures that I look at most of all is the days to maturity listed on almost all seed packs. It's the easiest way to get an earlier crop. Look for those that have shorter periods of the days to maturity. Now that might limit you on the varieties and it might not be the best flavor, but if you're a market gardener, then you're able to get crops earlier or maybe even later to the market and therefore control and get a better price. So um, just make some considerations there when you're selecting your varieties that you want to grow to look for those shorter season and make some compromises. Um, you know, if you're growing for yourself, then you probably want to look more on the flavor front. Um, but the longer a crop is in the ground, the more resources it's going to take up and the higher likelihood that it is to be lost to things like pests or weather anomalies. So um, this sweetness to hybrids. Um, if you're like me, you probably don't like growing hybrids as much because you can't reliably save seed from them. But I don't save seed from carrots anyway. I always buy them. So this 63 days makes a lot of sense to me because right now, I mean, I'm, I planted carrots back in March and they're still not ready. So um, take a look at um, the days to maturity and figure out how that might fit in your time frame. Here's just some examples of some short season crops that you might have thought just didn't exist. There are cabbages that grow under 70 days, even eggplant. Um, and I will say with these eggplant and peppers, this, you have to be aware that that 65 days there to maturity 
is from transplanting, it's not from seed. So um, just keep that in mind in accord with the kind of common practices of the production of it anyway. Uh, cantaloupe here, sweetie melon, 65 days. That's pretty amazing. So hybrid vigor is a thing. Hybrids can be great for that. There are some open pollinated crops that are very quick too. So always take a look at days to maturity um, when you're selecting a variety to grow. Um, just fits much better when you're trying to get multiple successions, multiple runs of a crop in one season. Also think about maybe the time of harvest, the timing and the size of the vegetable that you want. Um, growing some of these red Norland potatoes. And um, unfortunately, I just didn't line up to get them out early, so I planted them late. Um, so I'm harvesting them now as new potatoes. Um, maybe if you're growing cucumbers, you would pick them smaller for picklers. Or um, baby summer squash is all the rage in restaurants. Um, baby carrots also all the rage um, and sometimes you can even use your thinnings of carrots as baby carrots um, if you love tomatoes like me then um, be sure that you're growing some cherry tomatoes just because cherries are earlier um, so think about the time of harvest and maybe altering that time by um, using what we call the baby produce. Baby spinach is much quicker than uh, full season spinach. And just to drive the point home, um, here's just a look at these two different varieties of carrots. The sweetness to um, 63 days. The health master, which is also a hybrid. Um, different marketing here. I mean, it's packed with vitamin A. So if you need extra vitamin A, maybe that's a good thing. Or if you wanna market it based on nutritional factors, then there are reasons why you would wanna grow this, but look at that, 130 days, over twice the amount of time that this variety takes. Um, so again, choose your battle, but consider that those days to maturity and how that might influence your ability to extend the season. Here's some cold hardy crops. And I say early um, because I usually think about planting these in the spring, but um, we can also squeeze these in in the fall, um, in some cases in between frosts even. So of course our weather in Appalachic is quite erratic. So we might have a day or night in October that gets down into the 20s. And then we might have a day in November that gets up into the 70s. You never know. So I'm um, fitting some of these quick crops in like 42 days for arugula or some lettuces that are as, as low as 40 or spinach and mustard as low as 35 days. Um, say cold hardy here, um, but even the most cold hardy plant cannot handle repeated frosts and low light. So uh, keep that in mind as we transition into the fall. You really want to think about covering them with something and protecting them. Okay, so the next technique beyond um, site and variety selection, of course, is transplanting. So we can get a three to four week gain by transplanting crops instead of seeding them directly into the ground. So I'm just talking about starting them in some sort of tray, whether it's like this styrofoam tray here, a plastic tray, or um, just something that you, you know, kind of repurposed. Uh, yogurt cups, for instance. I mean, whatever you have laying around, you know, you, as long as it holds the soil, it can be a way to, to start things earlier. You might need a light if you don't have enough natural sun um, coming um, inside your home, let's just say if you're starting inside your home anyway. But just think about that. If you have it, if you have that seed reliably germinated um, in an area where you can control the climate, then you can get a huge gain um, instead of seeding it directly into the ground. 
Um, so I do this with almost all of my um, brassicas, a lot of my greens, and I even do it with beets too. Um, there are other ways that you can kind of get a little jump on that, but transplanting I think is probably the, one of the easiest. It does take space, it takes resources, it takes time, um, but it's one of the best ways to extend the season or get beyond that barrier of oppressive heat that we're facing right now. So of course you have to consider the light, you have to have enough light, um, as well as the proper quality of light. So you don't wanna put just like a regular incandescent bulb over your plants. You really need kind of a, a full spectrum light, um, but you can get these you know, at any department store really. Um, or you can get the LEDs these days off of the web for pretty cheap. So consider adding light if you don't have enough natural light. We always wanna think about um, preparing, adapting those transplants before they go outside. So slowly moving them outside for a few days before you expose them to the wind, water, and light, or I should say lack of water, and the presence of very high sunlight, and the, the swings in temperature too. So um, slowly harden them off before you put them outside. Um, at least a week is what I try to do for my acclimatization period. And uh, another thing that you can do is just go ahead and plant it in the ground, but use row cover to sort of regulate the temperatures so that there aren't massive swings. Um, for most transplants, at least for our warm season crops, we don't want nights lower than uh, 50 degrees. Um, even our cool season crops will grow much better when the nighttime temperatures are a little higher. So it, it's a great time to be starting um, crops that you would be putting out in the ground to extend this summer season. You also want to think about the size of any container you're using, whatever's holding that soil. We never want to get them root bound. And what we do at the community college is uh, create and use soil blocks. It's a great way to um, kind of go around that uh, issue of the size of the container. And of course, you got to get your timing right. So I um, hate to say it, but um, it's too late to be starting tomatoes. Um, or most of our warm season crops, um, there are some things that you could sneak in. Again, um, like your summer squash, um, especially if you're getting that baby squash. Some, there are, are a few corns that are quick enough to get in. Um, not a whole lot left right now with those windows of your warm season crops, but it's the perfect time for planting and planting your um, fall season crops and your winter crops as well. Looking at some of the structures that you can use, and right now we're thinking of kind of regulating that high temperature, getting it lower. Um, in the spring, we're thinking more of that frost protection. So here are just a few things that you could use. Um, again, we think of our first frost date usually being around October 10th um, for most of our region, but it can be much different in your site. Um, and again, at the community college, we, we've noticed the past few years, it's actually been in November um, when we've had that killing frost. Now we've had some light frost that didn't kill our warm season crops yet. But here's a way to protect them when we start to get closer to those frost dates. Um, so caps or cloches like these glass bells or um, the wonderful wall of water, which in this case, filling up things like two liter or one liter plastic bottles, taping them together and putting it around your plant. So these things are low tech, usually low cost. We can use um, materials like wine bottles or uh, pop bottles, upcycle them, turn them into something different. Um, but these are also potentially very high maintenance. If you think about it, we get that um, greenhouse effect from these cloches, for instance. Um, you, have to cover, you have to cover them when it's cold and take it off when it's warm. Otherwise, it'll act like a magnifying glass and just cook what you got in there. Um, 
in the spring, we can get a jump on the season up to a month. Um, when I lived in Blacksburg, I had a neighbor who used a wall of water and planted his tomatoes very deep. He was out there planting his tomatoes in usually late February or early March, but he, he had this technique and he had, you know, tomatoes before everybody. So you can get a big jump on the season by using these techniques. It just might take a lot of time and effort to do so. You mentioned uh, raised beds, of course, as a way to get a jump on the season or extend that summer a little longer or get your cool season crops out a little earlier. Um, that jump on the season is going to depend on your soil type that you're putting in there, as well as the materials that you're using for the raised bed. Um, the science has shown though, that you can get a soil temperature increase or decrease um, by up to eight to 13 degrees um, by using a raised bed instead of just growing directly in the ground, kind of at ground level. The idea here is that it's going to drain excess moisture, drying out quicker, which allows it to warm up or cool down quicker. The cool thing about raised beds, though, is it's really easy to add other forms of season extension, uh, like this guy here putting hoops over so that he could put plastic or row cover over top of his raised bed. Just some different examples of creatively using different materials to build raised beds. And again, you don't have to build anything. You can just mound your soil up and get the effect as well. All right, row cover is, I think, uh, probably the most useful thing in the toolbox when it comes to extending the season. And generally, we're thinking of row cover as some sort of flexible material that's either transparent, you can see through it like plastic or opaque, something like uh, the spun bonded polyester. Um, so both of these are technically row covers, even though we usually think more of the spun bonded polyester, polypropylene as what you traditionally call row cover. Um, with row cover, you can have it being, you know, basically a barrier over top of your plants, um, supported with things like PVC or wire um, or floating and just put it right on top of your plants. So you can cover one or you can cover many rows with it, um, depending on the width of the material that you buy. Usually comes in a, a roll. Um, you can purchase it locally at Wolf Farm Natural Elements in Abingdon, um, at least the spun bonded stuff. Um, you can get drop cloth and plastic from any hardware store. What are we getting with row cover? We're getting some wind protection, depending on the weight of it, and we're reducing the loss of moisture. Um, depending on when we use it, we can be kind of blocking some sunlight and getting a lower air temperature, or we can be basically using it more as the greenhouse effect and holding temperature. It's one of the best things, again, depending on the type to use for, as an insect barrier. So if you're planting brassicas right now, then you, you wanna have row cover for it. Your crop's needs though are always going to be that deciding factor. So what is that minimum, maximum, and optimum temperature for your crop? Um, does it need to be pollinated? So squash, for instance, if you use row cover for squash, then you need to take it off in the morning so that bees can get in there and pollinate your squash. Um, also think about the growth habit of your plant and how, what, at what point it's going to outgrow that row cover, how tall you might need your supports, etc. Some examples here of row cover and attachment. So plastic is a row cover. Um, but you're going to get that greenhouse effect quickly with plastic. So in this case, they're using PVC hoops with little PVC clips to put onto those hoops to hold that plastic on there. Um, here's some floating row cover. That's that spun bonded polyester just laying right on top of the plants, overlapping in the middle, um, using things like rocks to hold it down. And uh, here's some 
pre-slitted plastic as well. So you don't get that greenhouse effect quite as much, but you still are holding that moisture in. In this case, we're using wire hoops and soil to hold it down. So a lot of different materials out there, different designs of ways to support that material. Um, it's low tech and it's fairly inexpensive um, depending on what you're using. Um, there's a website, Agriculture Solutions, and um, you can get like 500 feet of, 500 foot roll of, I think it's 10 foot wide, um, kind of the lowest weight row cover um, for under a hundred bucks. So it's, it's cost effective for sure. I think it's worth it. But lots of different names for the row covers out there. This is the um, coming from Johnny's. Um, and I just wanted to share this, they call it Agribon. Um, the different weights, AG15, they're using just as an insect barrier um, for, and you can see it gets 90% light transmission. So it's lightweight, um, which means it's gonna tear fairly, fairly easily, um, but you're not blocking too much light, which means that you're still able to, to grow um, anything without you know, compromising that re reduction in light. As you increase the numbers here, that's increasing the weight of it. So it's better for frost protection or overwintering of crops, but you get less light transmission. So if you um, want to overwinter things, usually you go with a heavier row cover. Um, so like this AG70 down here, that only gets 30% light transmission, it's extra heavy. Um, and they use that for overwintering in harsh climate. It's not something you would really need to use around here. I mostly use this AG15, um, the, the lighter weight, higher light transmission myself. All right, so um, next, not a structure, but uh, mulch, very important for season extension because it's gonna trap moisture in the soil. If you're using an organic mulch, as it breaks down, it's going to add to the organic matter. And what I mean by organic is not necessarily like certified organic. I'm just talking about um, something that is going to break down, um, coming from plant material. Uh, we can also use mulches for temperature regulation, but we have to be careful about that because mulches are like a blanket. Technically they're insulating. Um, so they're great for overwintering. In fact, um, a lot of um, kind of less than hardy perennials can be perennialized just by a heavy covering of mulch. Um, could be just like broken down leaves even. Uh, our friend uh, Denny Peterson over at Blue Door Gardens, who uh, grows mostly flowers, um, overwinters all of her dahlias just by a heavy layer of mulch over top of them. So, um, but you have to time that right. You wanna, if you wanna hold the heat in, you wanna do it while it's still warm out because it's insulating. It's making, you know, it's gonna hold whatever temperature it is at that time in longer. So if you are mulching the ground when it's cooler, then it's gonna keep it cooler longer, if that makes sense. Also think again about uh, color. And it seems simple, but color does often correspond to its use. So think about like straw as a lighter color. So it, it's gonna tend to reflect the sun. So it's not warming the soil up as much, but can be warming the plants around. Um, also um, something darker like compost is gonna absorb heat more readily. So just think about what material it is and what it's adding. Also think about um, how it might affect your soil overall. Don't recommend using um, wood chips. Um, definitely don't recommend it if they're fresh because that's gonna rob the soil of nitrogen. Um, kind of the 21st century mulch is plastic. And if you talk about um, commercial production, organic commercial production especially, um, plastic is king. Um, they use plastic as mulch. It's been used for many years and they've created various colors that, to respond to different needs of plants. 
lots of advantages of that plastic mulch, similar to any other kind of mulch, except it doesn't break down as much. Um, but generally we get increased yields, earlier crops, higher crop quality, especially if you're thinking about growing things like melons, for instance. You get weed control and enhanced insect management all from plastic. Um, I'm neither for or against it. Rarely do I actually use it, but it does have its applications for sure. It works really well with drip irrigation. Um, in fact, the commercial growers often use an implement on the back of a tractor that's making their raised bed, mounding the soil, covering, uh, dropping a drip irrigation line, and covering it with plastic all in one pass. We usually use plastic mulches for high value crops though, things like melons, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, squash, eggplant, cannabis. Um, there are many different considerations for the color though, and this is where I'm gonna pop out my little notes over here. Um, here are some things that they found through studies of looking at these plastic mulches and how the color corresponds. To find that blue and green plastic actually increase the root to shoot ratios in turnips. So you get more roots for less shoots. Um, yellow, red, and blue increased insects in some cases. Um, yellow attracts cucumber beetles, so don't use that for your squash. Silver will repel certain aphid species and delays or reduces viruses in summer squash. White or gray can be useful for cooling the um, soil, but may require herbicide for weed control because weeds can still grow under um, white or gray plastic. So some examples there for the plastic culture, it's not the be all end all, but it um, can be used, um, especially early on to warm the soil for using darker plastic, um, later on cooling the soil with the lighter colored plastic. Um, so this is actually an image coming from one of those studies at Penn State University. Um, again, plastic mulch, take it or leave it, but that's how the commercial growers get those huge peppers. And huge melons too. There are uh, other options, of course. Here's that implement I was talking about. You can see it um, mounding the soil up with a lister on the side there and then laying that plastic under that soil. Um, I'm not sure if this one's also laying a, a drip tape or not, but um, if you're using plastic, you probably want to use some form of irrigation to accompany that. Um, they even make them biodegradable these days. Um, so there are different options out there. I can think of some good reasons to use that and some you know, maybe not so good reasons to use a biodegradable mulch. Um, Strawberries, almost all commercial strawberries, they use plastic for them. And you can see here that they're um, kind of combining mulches in some case. We got straw in the alley and um, plastic where it's planted. And um, this kind of just shows the different harvest dates. I'm basically saying that it speeds up the uh, time that these fruits get into maturity. Here's an example of using plastic with other types of season extension. So, so many different options out there, you all. Get creative. Um, so using like a cattle panel type fencing, um, use that for plastic support for taller plants like tomatoes. Or in this case, you're using um, rigid plastic or perforated plastic over PVC hoops. Um, Combining season extension methods can almost allow you to pretty much grow year round. Next simple structure here is a cold frame. Basically, you're just building something up to make a little mini greenhouse. So it could be a plastic film on a wooden frame, or in this case, a repurposed window on a hay frame. Either way, you want to have a hinge top to regulate the heat because these things do heat up on sunny days. Um, consider that. I think cold frames are great for growing greens in the winter or getting a jump start on your warm season crops in the spring. Um, right now, though, they're not very useful. Generally, um, 
low tech, usually smaller on the smaller side. Um, but you can get up to a 20 or 30 degree gain by using cold frames and uh, low tunnels. In this image, we've got uh, Elliot Coleman, who uh, one of the kind of forefathers of organic farming and market gardening. And you can see here, he's using um, a kind of low tunnel cold frame type of PVC conduit um, on rebar stakes. And he's weighing that row cover down with sandbags. Um, lots of great ways to go about creating uh, cold frames. Um, they can be very useful. Um, probably not so much right now though, because they're gonna get hot fast. What I think they are best for um, earlier plantings of leafy greens in the spring, especially things like lettuce, spinach, Swiss chard, and parsley. Um, they are best used in cool weather and lower light. Um, you can also use them to force flowers early in the spring too. Um, I would suggest that you could possibly use a cold frame for late summer seeding if you use a shade cloth instead of um, plastic or um, a lighter or maybe slightly a, a kind of a mid-grade row cover. Here's more examples of low tunnels. And so in this illustration here, they're covering it with plastic to get it started. And then um, they've used that cattle panel to support it, take that plastic off and it's got a trellis built in. So smart use of it. One of the things that we kind of have trouble with with the low tunnels is attaching um, whatever it is, plastic or row cover to the um, support. So here's just a smart way of doing that with a binder clip. Moving on up. Coop houses and high tunnels, um, which think of them like a greenhouse, except um, without heat, really. They're usually simple, a little bit more inexpensive than a greenhouse. Um, you're usually growing in the ground. And I think um, the protection from the elements is just as important as that uh, temperature regulation. And what I mean there, especially for like tomatoes and peppers, you get reduced disease incidents because you don't have um, rain, you don't have soil splash of microorganisms. So hoop houses and high tunnels are excellent way of season extension, um, but they do cost more money. Quick plug here for um, any of you landowners, check with the NRCS office, the EQIP or Environmental Quality Incentives Program often houses um, enough uh, grant funding to do a cost share program and you can almost get a hoop house for really cheap if not um, in some cases free so talk to your local usda nrcs office and you might be able to build one of these that will pay for itself um, pretty quickly if you're a market gardener of course um, they're great for season extension but in the winter we often find that we need to have um, stacking of structures. So here we've got low tunnels inside of a high tunnel um, and different attachments and different uh, crops growing under these. Here's just some um, examples of the effects of using an inner cover in a high tunnel. In this case on pak choy, you can see that without a cover in that high tunnel, it's growing, but it's not growing well. Um, with the uh, kind of spun bonded polyester, caught Typar in this case, um, looking pretty good. Six mil plastic looking great. So um, same timing on all, all of these, just different structures um, kind of corresponding with this image. The pinnacle of season extension is the greenhouse, but when we talk about greenhouses, we're talking about money um, to build them, but probably even more money to heat them. Um, so that's what separates a greenhouse from a high tunnel is the fact that we are heating it, we're using it for year round production, which makes our um, management of it a little bit more intensive. One thing about the greenhouse, you can definitely grow crops year round, 
but it's likely that you'll need supplemental lighting in the winter due to a short day factor. Um, when we start getting in November, the days are gonna get so short that we don't have enough natural sunlight to keep those plants growing. Um, it's basically just holding them over. Um, so adding some supplemental lighting will allow you to grow them a little bit longer, even just an hour or two extra. Here's just a schematic of using um, some low tunnels inside of a high tunnel. Um, I think it's important to just kind of draw it out and design it. And uh, also thinking about that angle of incidence. So where the sun is coming in and noting that in the summer months, it's directly overhead. In the winter months, it's lower. So you need to uh, think about how that works um, with the shade angles, any trees that might be in your landscape that could provide shade. Um, that will even exacerbate that short day factor in the winter. So ideally we want this kind of higher angle of incidence to be able to grow properly. So um, draw it out. When in doubt, draw it out. Here's a, just a table coming from uh, some growers in uh, North Carolina, which they just did the, their homework and uh, we're gonna steal it from them. <laughs> Um, to look at a cost comparison of the different types of season extension. And of course, um, looking down here, the most expensive is a heated greenhouse. And the cheapest is row cover. So um, unless you consider just variety selection, which is free. So um, if anybody wants to uh, take a, a look at this, I can send the PowerPoint over uh, to Chelsea and make sure that it can get distributed. All right, so in just to summarize real quick here, talking about extending the season by the season. So in the summer, right now we're thinking about heat and pest protection when we wanna continue growing in the summer season. And along with that, we also want to think about fertility management. So don't forget to fertilize. Um, I was just thinking about that the other day. Even though my tomatoes just started to come on, they're already starting to, to look like they're getting a little calcium deficient. So um, do a foliar spray of calcium as well as a top dressing of fertilizer. It helps for sure. You can't um, keep your crops and extend your season without properly managing that fertility. Don't forget to fertilize. We can still plant some succession and quick crops, but really we wanna think more about getting our fall crops started and in the ground. Ideally, we would have already had them started and we'd be transplanting them now. But you still have plenty of time for uh, different crops, especially those crops that are cool season crops. So for those, we're thinking more of frost protection. Um, you know, you might be able to keep your tomatoes going a little bit longer if you, if you can possibly cover them with something, um, but that is very difficult. And once we get nights in the 20s, there's no helping it, no saving it, um, unless you have a heated greenhouse. So we wanna think about beginning overwintering crops and also be aware of that short day factor for the fall. For the winter, we're mostly thinking of holdover crops, growing greens and root crops, and overwintering those crops that we uh, planted for overwintering that we want to be harvesting early in the spring. So they're going to be sitting there and you can harvest them later, but you uh, they're not going to be growing much unless you are adding some sort of supplemental light. In the winter, of course, we are protecting them from the cold. And of course, in the spring, thinking about the future here, we're back to frost protection, getting our early spring crops. So a lot of people think that, you know, we have one growing season. I prefer to think of it as we really have many different growing seasons. Um, so I think of early spring and then spring and then your early summer crops, your late summer crops, your fall crops your winter crop. So really we get more than just that one growing season. It's divided amongst the crop, how many days it takes to get it to maturity, depending on what the temperatures are like. So 
for spring, we're thinking of getting a jump on the summer crops and getting kind of those uh, same crops that we'd be planting for fall, and protecting them from the frost. All right, so that's all I've got for you all. Who's got questions? Um, and as you ask these questions, um, just know that I'll, I'll try to answer these the best of my ability, but just try to be specific about your objectives, what it is you might be wanting to extend the season for, um, and how long you might be wanting to grow it. Are you a market gardener? Are you a home gardener? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask those questions. I'll also take a look here at the um, Q and A. Um, so, Leah Bates suggested um, talking about wind here and uh, helping wind helping plants get stronger. And she said everything in moderation, definitely. Um, yes, just enough wind, not too much, not too little. Um, I kind of joke with my students about the Goldilocks syndrome. Everything has to be just right. So also uh, Leah is um, asking about uh, days to maturity. And um, from seed, yes, for most crops it is from seed, but um, for some crops, anything that it says transplant, um, like tomatoes, peppers, eggplant. I think the, those are like the big three, in my opinion, um, from seed. Uh, those are from transplant, not from seed. So I hope that answers that question, makes sense to you. And um, also, can we use grass clippings as um, mulch for the same effect? Um, definitely you can use grass clippings, but you have to be very careful about those grass clippings. Um, because they're hot, you know, when they're, when they're green, when they're fresh, they're really high in nitrogen and uh, that high nitrogen can um, burn plants. So generally we want to let our grass clippings dry out before using them as a mulch. All right, so that's all the questions I see in the Q&A. Anybody else have any other questions, comments, or concerns? Thank you so much for taking the time and teaching us tonight, Ben. That was awesome. Um, was it Andrea posted in the chat? Awesome info, very inspirational. Um, and yeah, it looks like we have covered all of our questions. Uh, if you want to send those or the PowerPoint over to me, I'd be happy to send it out. Um, I know some of some of our uh, viewers were taking screenshots. <laughs> so we'll send that out. And thank you again. If anybody has any questions at any time, you can either email me or email Ben. And yeah, we'll look forward to the next Grow Your Own webinar. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. Happy growing. <laughs>